Once upon a time, the idea of robots was the symbol of a futuristic world, a world in which technology and machines would replace human labor. To a large extent, that world is with us today in the 21st century. But the idea of robots, or at least automated machines, is much older than you might think. During the heyday of a golden age of science between the 9th and 14th centuries, engineers from across the Islamic world, from the Middle East to southern Spain, built many incredible devices. Water clocks, automatic serving machines, and a number of other innovative creations. I'm Jim Al-Khalili, a British professor of theoretical physics, but born in Baghdad. I've been researching some of the mechanical wonders of this golden age of science and comparing them to the engineering and technological advances of the modern world. For years, we've been promised that we'd have robots in our homes carrying out household chores. And that hasn't really happened. Well, here's something that might change all that. In this lab, they're developing a prototype robot that we might, sometime soon, have in our kitchens at home. This is the Molly Robotic Kitchen a pair of fully computerized mechanical arms set in a purpose-built capsule. The arms replicate the movements of a human chef, and today, the robot's cooking me a crab bisque. So you can see it moves not like a robot, you'd imagine, not in those kind of very simple movements you get from a robot, but a very human and fluid movement. Using motion capture, we've recorded the movements of a chef's hands while they're cooking a real recipe. And then this system will reproduce those movements exactly. So in principle, it should be exactly as good a cook as it's, a master chef. According to the chef, it's more consistent than a human chef. So when a chef is cooking, they can't always get the timings and the temperatures and the amounts exactly right. It's interesting, we always get the same pattern of mess around the saucepan. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a robot, we get the same drip. Because it's repeating because it's precisely repeat. exactly. the same motions. I mean, at the moment, you have to have all the ingredients at exactly the right place because, of course, the robot is operating blind, isn't it? It's, it's not blind, deaf, and numb, so it can't feel and it can't see what it's doing. One of the reasons robots haven't made it into the home yet is how difficult it is to do all the 3D vision in complex lighting environments and do all the planning actually intelligently being able to make decisions like, oh, the salt is not where I That's thought right. it was going to yes. be. Find it, recognise it. Yes, and even try to find it hiding behind something or mixed in with things that look similar. The sort That's, of things that we take for granted. We find very, very easy, but a, a computer finds extremely hard. So we've taken a, a much simpler approach, and that's to standardise everything in the kitchen and make it a very controlled environment with controlled lighting and defined positions for the ingredients. Now we can just run this recipe and it works every single time. And the last detail is to add a few drops of truffle oil. Ah. And there you go. Mm. If I'd eaten this in a restaurant, if it's cooked by a human chef, I guess I wouldn't be surprised. I'd enjoy it. For some reason, I, I wasn't quite expecting it to taste so nice and to... I mean, this is exactly as a chef would cook it. And yet I've witnessed a robot making me a very nice dish. Of course, this robot relies on the very latest technology. But what was the state of the art at the beginning of the Golden Age? Well, we find our answer in the Kitab al Hiyan, or the Book of Tricks, written around 850 AD by the three Banu Musa brothers. The book contains a range of ingenious inventions and contraptions, everything from entertainment to making life easier. 
things like water dispensing devices, uh, a self-correcting lamp, and lots of different mechanical tools. They drew their inspiration from ancient Greek, Chinese, Persian, and Indian engineering. But it's believed that the inventions in the book go much further than anything else that had been seen before. At the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar, they have an early copy of the Kitab al-Hayal in their collection. I'm really excited about this manuscript, Bill, because it's probably one of the most famous texts of the medieval world. The original uh, was written in the mid-9th century by the Banu Musa brothers. One was an astronomer, one was a mathematician, and one was and an, the engineer. Other was an engineer. Yeah. And they were really the center of scientific life in uh, Baghdad during the, the golden age of science. The Abbasid Caliph, El Ma'mun, recognized the talents of the brothers from an early age and sent them to study in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, where great texts were gathered from across the globe and translated into Arabic. During their time in the House of Wisdom, they grew in influence and even became patrons of other translators. As well as translation, they wrote many works of their own, including the Book of Tricks. It's called the Kitab al-Hiyal, which literally means the, the book of tricks, or the book of trickery. But they're not tricks in the sense of magic tricks. These are no. contraptions and devices, I guess executive toys is probably the best term for it. But I mean, it's full of beautiful diagrams showing valves and levers and gears, and uh, it's very, very clever. They employ these incredibly forward-thinking processes, things that weren't really adapted until many centuries later, things like crankshafts. They were using things like differences in pressures in, in liquids and also in, in air to make things appear to move by themselves, to act into their own volition. There's the famous robotic flute player that exactly. operates through sort of water pressure. Yep, and there's the self-trimming lamp. There's, there's all these kind of things that must have seemed like magic at the time, hence the idea of trickery. I guess a lot of the ideas do go back to the ancient Greeks, people like Archimedes, for instance, but they're putting them together in a way that was slightly different. Yes, it's not just a, a translation movement, it's a, a rethinking movement as well. The, the stuff in this book is more than just fun toys. It, it tells us that what they were doing at this time, it was the mid ninth century, mm -hmm. the, 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 the zenith of the golden age, they were carrying out proper scientific experimentation. John Scott is a mechanical engineer based in Cambridgeshire in the UK. He builds and tests historic inventions and currently he's reconstructing one of the Banu Musa brothers' most complicated devices, the flute which plays itself. Right, Jim, here's the device. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, you even got the little character yes, there. Yes, yes. So um, the Banu Musa brothers are, are said to have built this, or at least wrote about this, this yeah. flute that plays itself. Yeah. yeah. How much detail was there that you could get hold of to allow you to reproduce it? Well, there was a reasonable amount. There are references, but there are different, uh, apparently different translations, so some things are not entirely clear. Presumably, modern scholars, historians, looking back at this, there's a lot of guesswork involved. Oh, absolutely, about yeah. How they solved the problems, yeah. if indeed they did. Yeah. So talk me through it. How does this work? Right, well, the basic principle is that there is a, a drive wheel here which operates this rotating drum. That would have been water-powered originally. Right. Yeah. And there are a series of, effectively, cams which lift little arms which then uh, seal or unseal the... Uh, tone holes on the on the flute and air comes yeah. passes through so air comes in here okay well can we have a demonstration yeah Let's we can it. turn some air on so you get a, a little tone there right and as you rotate that you find it going. <laughs> now at the moment it's what you might call programmed to make a, a scale but of course you could make tunes out of it by varying these that's Device. fantastic so you've got this just as a scale, but of course these could be rearranged. Yes. 
in, in a sense, this is an early programmable it machine. It is very much so. And, and if you think it's way before musical boxes, which were sort of 16th, 17th century inventions, though, yes, it's, it's a very clever thing for, for the period. But, of course, you use a pressurised air supply to blow the air through. How would the Benamusa brothers have done this? Well, as far as we know from the references, there are, there are two ways. One was apparently to provide a steam supply, a very low-pressure steam supply. So and that, that in itself is well, it, it is steam power. Yes, the early the steam century. power, that's right. The other way of doing it was to use a, a system of chambers, two chambers, which could be filled up with water and emptied. If you imagine the two chambers, as one is filling up, the other one is going down. This one filling up, the air trapped is being fed into here. And then this one starts to empty, this one starts to fill, and the air trapped in there is then provides the continuous flow. Right. So it's like this operation, much like a, a, a conventional bellows, but this is a water-powered bellows. So, so the whole contraption oh, is, is controlled yeah, by ab- water, brilliant, yeah. water powering, yeah. moving the uh, yeah, these yeah. wheels and cogs yeah, around, but yeah. water yeah. also powering, pushing yeah. the air through it yeah. in the first place. Yeah. It fits in with their general philosophy because they were obviously involved a lot in water lifting, water movement devices. So water was obviously, as a motive power, mm. was very much in mind. So I imagine when they came to develop this, water power was the first thing they thought of to make it work. Water played a key role in many medieval engineering projects, both large and small. The Islamic world inherited many techniques of irrigation and water supply from the Egyptians, Greeks and Romans. This beautiful structure is an underground water reservoir in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, that was built by the Romans in the 6th century. The engineers of the Golden Age preserved this. But they also modified, improved, and constructed their own water projects. They also developed new techniques to capture, store, and raise water. Many sophisticated hydraulic pumps and water raising devices were developed by Al Jazeri, one of the most prolific engineers of the Islamic world. Born in the 12th century, he served as a royal engineer at the Artuklu Palace in what is now Turkey. At Istanbul's Museum of the History of Science and Technology in Islam, they've built working models of some of Al Jazeera's water devices. Dr. Detlef Quintern explains them to me. As you have a look inside this building, you can see a donkey, and this donkey moving a mechanism, bringing into running these gears, as you can see, and then lifting the water up to these channels. That's a, quite a sophisticated machine. It is a sophisticated, I mean, Al Jazeera, he was a more of fascinating engineering. Water devices like Al Jazeera's were hugely important throughout the Islamic world as their empire spread across the globe. Engineers of the Golden Age built reservoirs and impressive dams, many of which still survive today across the Middle East and Islamic Spain. As well as these dams, in places like Cordoba, Iran and Syria, irrigation was also provided by noriyas from the Arabic Naora, which are giant scooping water wheels. But as populations grew throughout the Islamic world, it became necessary to have more advanced devices. And towards the end of the 12th century, El Jazeera developed sophisticated water pumps. So have a look on this even more sophisticated water lifting devices. As the water moves the water wheel round, that's moving backwards and forwards. It's like a double piston pumping up the water through both pipes, up right up to the tower. It lifts and pumps the water up to a height of 11 meter. Al Jazeera combines several sophisticated mechanisms. The pump works via valves that create a partial vacuum causing the water to be sucked up from the river below. This pump is also remarkable because it has a double action. Each side takes it in turn. This double pumping makes it much more efficient. The machine is driven by the river itself, which turns a water wheel. And that water wheel is attached to gears and two pistons. Water is sucked up from the river by the pistons, 
which slide back and forth as the gear turns. By doing this, Al Jazeera is converting the rotating movement of the water wheel into a linear side-to-side -side motion. It's possibly the earliest description of a crank slider, a fundamental component of many modern machines, including car engines. We know about Al Jazeera's devices because he wrote about them in great detail. And an early copy of his greatest work exists right here in Istanbul. The Ottomans conquered Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, towards the end of the Golden Age. And when they took power, many thousands of manuscripts were transferred here to Istanbul. This is a wonderful text. It dates back to the mid-1200s. Uh, the title of the book is Kitab al-Jama' fil ilmi wal amal which translates as far as I can tell to the complete book of knowledge and work. What is lovely about it is that throughout the text are these wonderful vivid color diagrams of his contraptions and devices. They get increasingly complex and ingenious. This is a particular favorite of mine. Uh, because it depicts an animal, an ox or a donkey, which is supposedly turning this axis and acting to pump the water. But at least one account suggests that actually the animal isn't needed at all. It's only there so as not to scare people into thinking this is some kind of magic. Essentially, the water is in the river here, and as it drops down below the river, the energy, the kinetic energy of the water, turns this axis by a set of gears which operates a vertical axis and spins it. That in turn operates another gear which lifts the water in these vessels up to a higher level. So it's self-sustaining, it's beautiful, and you don't need an, an ox or a donkey to operate it at all. <laughs> In Islam, followers of the faith are required to pray at specific times during the day, and so knowing the time accurately is very important. Today, clocks like this outside a mosque give the precise times for prayer. <laughs> Al Jazeera and other engineers of the Golden Age devised a great many clocks, which were more accurate and elaborate than what had gone before. Al Jazeera wrote about clocks that relied on candles, were driven by weights, or were regulated by water. But his most famous creation was the extravagant elephant clock. Professor Attila Beer is one of the foremost scholars of the engineers of the Golden Age. He studied the original description of the clock, written in Al Jazeera's great text. Ve o kitapta bu sistemin minyatürü mevcuttur ve bütün detaylar da mevcuttur. Bu bu detaylara istinaden bu model aynen yapıldı. So all the details about the mechanisms are all written and preserved in this book. The elephant clock not only showcases the height of sophistication in mechanics at the time, it's also an early representation of the multiculturalism that existed during the Golden Age. Bu şeyi yaparken, bu düzeni kurarken birçok kültürün birlikte yoğrulmasını görüyoruz. Burada Çin'den alınmış olan ejderhayı, Hint'in sembolü olan fili görüyoruz ve süslemeler de arabesk süslemelerle birlikte çok güzel bir dekorasyon ve bir show mekanizması ortaya çıkmış oluyor. The clock tells the time with an indicator at the top, 
showing the number of hours since sunrise. But the main mechanism for this clock is hidden inside the elephant's belly, a bowl that floats on a water tank and every half hour creates an eye-catching display. The bowl slowly fills with water from a hole in its bottom and sinks after half an hour. When it sinks, it tugs a series of pulleys and strings which run all the way to the top of the clock. They connect the bowl to a channel of balls which is concealed in the top. The tugging of the pulleys and strings causes the channel to tilt and so one ball is released. This makes the bird on the top spin round and the time indicator advances. The ball travels through and falls from a falcon's beak into a serpent's mouth, causing it to tilt. And this causes the elephant driver to beat the elephant. As the mechanisms inside the clock are triggered, the floating bowl is pulled back up and starts filling with water again for the next half hour. There's another inventor who's been associated with perhaps one of the most extravagant claims of the Golden Age. Abbas ibn Farnas lived in the 9th century, the same time as the Banu Musa brothers, and came from Andalusia. Amongst his achievements, he studied glass extensively, devising a new method of manufacturing coloured glass, and even making early corrective lenses, a precursor to reading glasses. But there's one story about him which, if true, is absolutely remarkable. Humankind has always dreamt of flight, since long before the Wright brothers built their first aeroplane. In fact, we know that back in the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci drew diagrams of gliders. But supposedly 700 years before da Vinci, Abbas ibn Farnas had already taken to the skies. Andy Green is a pilot with the British Royal Air Force, and I want to get his opinion on whether Ibn Farnas could really have made himself fly over a thousand years ago. The story goes that Ibn Farnas devoted years of his life to building wings made from wood and bird feathers. Accounts say that he jumped off a tower or a hillside and remained airborne for minutes, sailing over the flat lands outside Cordoba. Just how likely is this story to have been true? I'd love to think it was possible, but he's got some big challenges in doing that. And a thousand years ago, having the engineering structural technology to be able to produce the wings, the materials at the time would have left him with a very heavy flying machine. He would have had to run awfully quickly to get it airborne even faster to survive the landing. Having the centre of gravity in exactly the right place and actually having the controls to be able to control the roll, the pitch, the yaw. You know, there's a hundred years of design and, and uh, science and development have gone into the technology on this aeroplane right now. What also makes it even more challenging is that uh, supposedly he didn't even have a tail attached to his wings, which would have made landing pretty problematic, I guess. Well, very simply, without this piece, this aeroplane will not fly. Or indeed, you won't be able to control the lift when you come into landing. I would love to believe that it is possible he could have done this, but more importantly, he is recognised as one of the pioneers of aviation. Well, that's it. It might be apocryphal, but it's what he stood for as, as an innovator, as an inspiration to later generations that's important. He is part of the amazing story of aviation. We don't know for sure whether Abbas ibn Farnas' story is true, but what we do know is that there were incredible engineers and inventors during the Islamic world in the Golden Age, men like Al Jazeri and the Banu Musa brothers, who created incredible mechanisms to build intricate and detailed inventions over a thousand years ago. Next time, 
we look at how the scholars of the Golden Age started to develop the field of chemistry. Oh, wow. We see how they created new equipment and industrialized chemical processing. They put the pure olive oil here. And how they began to turn the superstition of alchemy into the science of chemistry, so important to our lives today.